these days, there doesn't seem like there's any shortage of answers out there to your questions, especially in the gardening space. The problem is, it all seems like information overload, cluttered with irrelevant facts. Enter the Garden Quickie. Hyper-focused two-minute videos answering specific gardening questions without all the fluff. I hope you've enjoyed watching them as much as I've enjoyed making them. Here's episodes 21 to 30. If we were to take a microscopic peek below the surface of my beet bed here, we'd surely see some amazing things. An active, growing, completely synergistic soil profile capable of supporting great things. And we count on that. We count on the soil in our gardens to provide nearly everything that our crops need to produce our epic bounties. But it's not indestructible. Modern agriculture has been dead set on destroying the top layers of soil in our most fertile areas since the Dust Bowl era of the 1930s. You see, digging or tilling of any soil profile has three damaging effects. First, it fractures the soil, disrupting the natural air, water, and nutrient pathways that have formed to sustain life. Next, it exposes delicate topsoils that are meant to be moist, protected, and covered, causing them to dry out and become ineffective. And finally, if that wasn't enough, digging up the dirt exposes colonizing weed seeds that might have otherwise been buried into obscurity. And now they're free to sprout, grow, and annoy us for the rest of the year. Not really ideal, is it? Fortunately for us gardeners, we have a few tricks up our sleeve that allows us to preserve that valuable soil structure while still growing our favorite crops. Hi. I'm Jeff from the Right Tomato Farms and welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we answer your most asked garden questions. And today is all about no-dig gardening. There are three things you can do in your garden right now to implement no-till practices. Time's short, so let's get to it. The first way is a big one, and it's how we weed or dispose of previous crops. Traditionally, unwanted plants are simply pulled out, dug up, or dug under. To protect our soils and our backs, simply cut down all unwanted plants at the root collar. You know, where the stem meets the soil. Easier on you, easier on your garden. Next, we can do what's called sheet mulching. That is, we can lay down barriers of paper, leaves, straw, or any compostable material. These layers suppress weeds, protect the topsoil from the elements, and provide an excellent landing pad to plant the next great crop. Literally, win, win, win. Lastly, we can use that perfect landing pad to plant the latest crop right on the surface. Add in some new soil around it, let the roots find their own way down the soil profile. Brilliant. And you know what else might be brilliant? Hopefully the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Watering, one of the most fundamentally vital responsibilities for any grower. Without adequate moisture, your plants will suffer. And seedlings, well, it can be fatal in a shorter amount of time than you think. But it doesn't have to be scary, complicated, or laborsome, because when we're dealing with seedling trays or small pots, there's a trick that commercial and professional growers employ to ensure perfect watering every time. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Right Tomato Farms, and welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we tackle the most important growing questions of the day. And today is all about watering from below. If you've watched any video of mine about germinating seedlings, growing seedlings, or transplanting young plants, you'll have noticed that I always water from below. Always. Time's ticking, so let's get into this. The first reason that I always water my trays in small pots from below is to avoid the destruction of overhead watering. Running, falling, and dripping water is an absolute force of nature. Freshly seeded pots when watered from above are a disaster. 
Soil, water, and most likely your seeds are going to end up everywhere. The blast of water on established and mulched plants is tolerable. On freshly sown trays, forget about it. And not only the immediate destruction, but watering from above changes, compresses, and generally disrupts the soil structure altogether. The second reason to water from below is to avoid transplant shock. When moving delicate young plugs or plants onto larger pots and tray systems, exposing those roots to anything but perfectly moist soil conditions is always avoided. Young roots are sensitive and you want the best transition possible to maximize their growth trajectory. And lastly, I always water from below because it's the perfect amount every time. Soil is a sponge. The tiny air gaps in your seeding and potting mixes hold both air and water. Allow that soil to take up as much water as it can, nothing more, nothing less. Any good soil mix worth its salt will soak up and hold on to a staggering amount of moisture. Take the guesswork out of watering and your growing endeavors will be that much more fruitful. Know what else is fruitful? Quite likely, the next episode of the Garden Quickie. One of the top physical requirements for healthy plants is a space to grow. Competition for air, water, and nutrients is real, but for a root veggie like beets, space is tops on that list. Without room to grow, beetroots and that swollen taproot that's so desired will be stunted, malformed, and at best disappointing. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms, and welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we solve the most important growing questions of the day. And today is all about thinning beets. No matter how carefully you space and sow your beets, they'll sprout in bunches and need to be thinned. Unlike some crops like these carrots here, where you can just space your seeds and rows diligently and methodically, no matter how carefully you planted your beet seeds, thinning is in your near future. Okay, but why is that? Well, this is explained by looking at the beet seed itself. You see, beet seeds aren't like other seeds, which are smooth, sleek, and simple in design. Beet seeds are actually a cluster of many seeds, called a multi-germ. Crazy, eh? So no matter how careful and well you space your beet seeds initially, they're always going to grow up in groups and require thinning later. Okay, that's the why, let's get into the how. Under normal conditions, Beets will sprout in about a week. They start with a couple of pretty little green things that look like leaves, but they aren't. These are cotyledons, sometimes referred to as seed leaves. And while they come up with gusto and really fill out the rows nicely, don't thin just yet. Thinning your beets becomes a timing thing, so we want to see a little bit more development of the plants so that we can selectively thin out the weaker specimens. It's commonly suggested to thin beets when they reach about three inches tall. But I find that to be a pretty poor and rudimentary guideline. Instead, I wait until the plants have at least two sets of true leaves. Now, these will be in addition to the first non-true leaves that we talked about earlier. Once your beets have two sets of leaves, which will be about a month after planting or three weeks after germination, they're ready to thin. Don't pull them up. The root systems will be all intertwined and connected, and we don't want to disturb the ones that we're keeping. Simply cut them down right at the root collar, you know, where the stem meets the soil. Right now, we're aiming for a four to six inch spacing between the plants. It seems harsh because there's so many beet plants, but it's the reality of the crop. Know what else is a reality? Seeing you guys in the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Amazingly enough, this is both the beginning and the end of this garlic's life. One of the longest crops we grow, this annual allium can take upwards of nine months to grow, from clove to bulb, planting to harvest, spanning all four seasons. The planting is simple enough, and I've covered it in full right here, but it's the life cycle of garlic that causes the most confusion. Hi. I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms, and welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, 
we tackle the most important growing questions of the day. And today is a crash course in the life cycle of garlic. Garlic starts out its life as the bulb we just harvested. Dried, cured, and stored over summer, the bulbs hold inside the powerhouse cloves that we need for fall planting. In some warmer regions, garlic can be planted in the early spring and harvested that same year. These short length soft neck varieties are great for those in areas without a true winter. But today, we're gonna focus on the hard neck types, the ones with the long growing season that we typically grow here in the north. Moving along, garlic is planted a month or more before that all important fall frost date. The idea is for the cloves to sit in this semi-dormant state in cold conditions, often below freezing, to undergo a process known as vernalization. This is the prolonged exposure to cold temperatures to trigger the next stage in that plant's life cycle. Normally it's for flowering, but in the case of garlic, it's actually for bulb formation. You know, the things we're after. Even as the temperatures dip, the garlic is still growing. You can't see it, because often it's only below the soil surface through the formation of its roots. But sometimes in a warm fall, or if you planted too early, green shoots will pop up. While not ideal, it's usually of no detriment to the plant. Check this out. This garlic was planted only two weeks ago, and you can see how fast it's starting to root. I live in a pretty warm climate though, and winter does take its time to get here. So it's no surprise that my bulbs often root in the first couple of weeks. All right, onward. As the garlic progresses through winter, the roots continue to grow and that clove changes from a single structure to a bulb itself, albeit small and often slightly smaller than the clove you planted. Soon enough though, warmer temperatures trigger the garlics to sprout. Sort of analogous to seeds germinating in the annual spring sprout fest. And it's through this spring and early summer when the bulb does all of its growing. It's the final three to four months where all of the energy is put into the actual crop we're after. And while almost all the growth occurs during this last stage, the initial chilling period is what allows it to happen. So don't skip that step. Just like you shouldn't skip the next episode of the Garden Quickie. In warm climates, pepper plants are actually perennials growing, flowering, and fruiting year-round. Here, not so much. The onset of fall signals the end of my pepper plants. And traditionally, the grower, backyard or commercial, cuts their pepper plants down only to restart the entire process again from seed in a couple of months. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms, and welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we tackle the most important growing questions of the day. And today is all about overwintering your pepper plants. Overwintering your pepper plants is done in three steps. Pruning, digging, and then replanting. Do note that if you live in an area that stays above 60 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius, you can leave your peppers in the ground all year. If you don't get a true winter or even a frost, you can just leave your peppers in the ground, covering them for those rare days where the temperature does dip. For the rest of us, it's time to get to work. First up is pruning, and you wanna be doing this about three to four weeks before that first fall frost date. The goal here is to remove the bulk of the stems and foliage without killing the plants. For all but the branchiest of varieties, I take them down to a maximum of one to two nodes above that first Y. Let me show you what that means. Pepper plants branch off in a series of Y junctions, known as nodes. At level one, we have the initial node. What we wanna do is take the plants down to one or two levels above that first Y. If it makes it easier to see what you're doing, you can cut off all the foliage first because the end result is a bare stem with only three to four nodes remaining. It seems harsh, but that's the reality of overwintering peppers. With the majority of the foliage and branches gone, our simplified peppers can now be dug up. Pepper plants have extensive root systems, but we just want the immediate root ball. Try to get as much as you can though, but a one foot radius around the plant is usually enough. I shake off as much soil as possible and go fresh for the repotting. Give your peppers a decent sized pot, two gallons or so, but nothing too crazy. Their growth will be limited over their time indoors 
And if you're doing several pepper plants, space can get tight pretty quick. Using a sterile organic potting mix, plant your peppers right up to their original root color, where the stem meets the soil. As an aside, I also take the time to spray these guys down with a natural soap insecticide. Because aphid and pest outbreaks are not only common, but they're also severe with no natural pressures to keep their populations in check indoors. If the soil is quite moist, no need to water right away. And in fact, our watering schedule will be much more infrequent than it is in the summer. Give the plants a few hours of light daily and try to keep the temperatures below 65 degrees Fahrenheit or 18 degrees Celsius. An unheated garage or solarium works best. We're not actually trying to grow the pepper plants. We're just trying to keep them alive in a semi-dormant state. Water the plants once a month or so and prepare for replanting outside at least three to four weeks after your last spring frost, bringing you full circle to the satisfaction of overwintering your pepper plants. Know what else is satisfying? Surely the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Seeds are one of nature's miracles, truly. For this to grow into this, or even for these tiny guys, to grow into these is nothing short of amazing. But it doesn't feel very amazing when your seeds sprout, then quickly die. Certainly, while damping off could be an issue, the shallow nature of sowing herb seeds and other similar crops is likely the culprit. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms, and welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we tackle the most important gardening questions of the day. And today is all about my patented shallow seed sowing trick. Many plants, specifically herbs, are planted right at the soil surface. Couple this with the best germination temperatures being quite high and indoors being generally drier as well. We run the risk of the seeds drying out and never sprouting, or worse, sprouting and then drying out and dying. So what do we do? Do we just quit our jobs and miss the soil four times a day until the plants are rooted and established? Uh, no, there's an easier way. Let me show you how. Sow your seeds like you normally would with a skim coat of soil on top. Next, fold up a paper towel, just one, to fully cover the soil surface. Water from above and keep that paper towel damp by checking on it every couple of days. Once every two days is far more doable than four times a day, every day. In that optimum temperature range, very soon your seeds will sprout. Keep the paper towel on though and keep it moist. It's that extra two to three days after the seeds have sprouted that's gonna allow them to send down those roots and establish the plants properly, eliminating completely the risk of them drying out. Better germination rates, better plants, better harvest. Know what else is better though? Hopefully you guys check it out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. I try to collect rainwater every chance I get. Sometimes relatively complex and ingenious. Other times rudimentary, but still effective. But why go through any trouble at all? Water is water, right? Just get it from the tap. Actually, no, not really. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Right Tomato Farm, and welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we talk about the most important aspects of gardening. And today is all about rainwater versus tap water. And more specifically, which water is best for our plants and gardens? But to answer that question, we first have to look at the chemistry and molecular differences of each. Rainwater is pure distilled water evaporated by the sun and returned to us as rainfall. Although pure, it's not entirely just H2O. Rain picks up particles in the atmosphere on its way down, and it's also slightly acidic. This is a good thing, because that rainwater is going to neutralize alkaline salts in the soil that chemically prevent your crops from accessing nutrients. On top of that, rainwater actually contains nitrogen in soluble form, 
which is why your plants seem to be so green after a good rainfall. But the greater discrepancy between rainwater and tap water comes when we look at the latter. Tap water in most municipalities contains chlorine and fluoride. These two chemicals are toxic to nearly all plants. Further to that, calcium and magnesium, two elements that can make a city's tap water hard, are often remedied by adding water softeners such as sodium. Well, terrestrial plants and salt are not exactly the best of friends. Add in the fact that this chemical cocktail can also wreak havoc on the soil microorganisms and biology of your garden, and you have a potentially toxic environment brewing right in your own backyard. I'm not saying that watering your garden with your hose or sprinkler is gonna kill all your plants, but the cumulative effects of it over time can definitely affect the plant health and crop productivity. Water is a major component in every single plant function, and a subpar source of water can no doubt contribute to subpar crops. You know what isn't subpar though? These sugar snap peas, and hopefully the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Strawberries. That perennial berry favorite giving us much, much more than it asks in return. And while we don't have to do much to obtain berry nirvana with a good strawberry patch, there's definitely a few things you don't want to be doing this winter. Five, in fact. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms, and welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we tackle the most important garden questions of the day. And today is all about your winter strawberry don'ts. Like I said, there's five things you really need to avoid doing to your strawberry mother plants this winter. Time short, so let's dive right in. First up, we have fertilizing. Yeah, don't, it doesn't need any. Your strawberry plants are entering dormancy if they haven't already. The last thing we wanna do is boost the soil to entice them to start growing. They don't need it, save it for spring. In that same train of thought, don't bring your strawberries inside either. Not into a greenhouse, not into your garage. Strawberries produce the next year's fruit buds in the fall and winter. Like right now. If that plant breaks dormancy just before the winter hits, or even during the winter, there goes next year's fruit, and possibly the plant. And about those developing flower buds, don't cut them off. As obvious as that may sound, it's actually quite easy to accidentally nip them off while you're trimming the old foliage. I've done it too many times to count, so take it from me, just be careful. Another mistake that people often make when winterizing their strawberries is mulching too early. Just like fertilizing or bringing the plants inside, mulching too early can cause your plants to warm up, reversing the natural cycle of dormancy. Again, strawberry plants need this winter dormancy. It's part of their life strategy. Wait until at least two to three hard frosts before you start mulching. And finally, the fifth thing to avoid doing with your strawberry plants this winter is to dig them up and divide them. Strawberry plants need at least a month or more before your first fall frost date to regrow and establish themselves. Dividing them in the winter is a certain death sentence. So either leave it until the spring or do it early enough in the fall so that the plants can have a chance. All right, that's a lot of don'ts. But you know what else you shouldn't do? Miss the next episode of The Garden Quickie. For most of us, we planted our garlic months ago. It's nestled in the ground, nice and cozy, waiting patiently to spring into action next year. And while not forgotten, garlic is certainly not on our radar until it's time for that epic harvest next summer. Unless, of course, this happens. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms, and welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we solve the most important growing questions of the day. And today is all about early garlic sprouting. Why does it happen? Is it bad for the garlic? And what should we do about it? Time short, so let's get into it. In an ideal world, 
Garlic is planted in the late fall, lies in a semi-dormant state, producing roots and the developing bulb, all underground. One thing and one thing alone causes those garlic bulbs to sprout, and that's temperature. If you planted your cloves a little early, or your fall is a little bit warmer than normal, these guys are gonna sprout green shoots. It's not what we want, but don't be alarmed or discouraged. Normally, it's not harmful for the garlic at all. The leaves can be exposed, frozen, or even die off. Normally, this won't have much effect on the crop at all. It's not ideal as it is wasted energy, but it's not fatal for the plants. One instance where it can be harmful though, is with excess moisture. Those exposed shoots can actually catch precipitation, wick the moisture down, and rot out the developing bulbs. It's actually pretty rare though, and if you have good soil drainage, it's nothing to worry about. As for what actions to take, usually nothing. There's not much you can do about it once they've already sprouted. However, if you are worried about it and they haven't sprouted yet, my best suggestion would be to delay mulching and expose those plants to get them into that dormancy faster. Then right before the cold weather hits, get that mulch on nice and thick and protect the garlic like we normally would. Garlic wants to sprout. It's only held back by the dropping temperatures and it's why we plant it so late in the fall. But if it does sprout, don't worry. Likely, it's gonna be fine. Know what else is fine? Probably the next episode of the Garden Quickie. This past summer, we showed you how to build your own garden beds, fill them economically as to not break the bank, and hopefully experience award-winning crops. Yikes. That's good and all, but how do we replicate that success next year when half the soil in our raised bed is now magically missing? Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms, and welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, where in two minutes or less, we solve the most important growing questions of the day. And today is all about that missing soil. Where did it all go? Is there something wrong with my gardening? How can I fix this? First up, nothing's wrong. It's completely normal, and it happens for three reasons. One, if you filled your garden bed right to the top with a quality high organic ratio mix, that organic matter is gonna decompose. And when it does, it'll take up far less room. Second, plants use up the soil. They use specific elements and compounds within the soil to produce their impressive foliage and those amazing harvests. And three, the soil level goes down simply because it settles. Watering, weeding, your crop's roots, they all contribute to closing up those large air gaps in the soil, causing it to compact on itself. It's totally normal. Okay, so how do we fix it without breaking the bank? There's three ways to do it that shouldn't cost you more than a few pennies. First, don't grab the stems of your spent plants and yank them out of the ground. Instead, Cut them down right at the root collar and leave them in place to decompose. Second, mulch heavily, both during the growing season and during the dormant period. That mulch will break down, adding to the top layers of soil. Finally, and most effective, is to plant a cover crop. Cover crops such as this fall rye here build up the soil to new heights, completely negating the annual soil loss. A couple years ago, these beds over here lost nearly half their soil. And at two feet tall, that's a lot of soil. Just one cover crop brought it right back to the top level with the most amazing soil that you can't even buy. You know what else should be amazing? Hopefully the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Thanks for watching, guys. And hey, if Garden Quickies are your thing, be sure to click on this playlist here as we explore and solve more growing issues in two minutes or less.